Um, we, uh, we looked at the death of Abraham last time and, and just uh, this man's life and, and the legacy that he left. He was, he was uh, gathered to his people. He died in a good old age. Somebody has said that Abraham died full. <laughs> if they're going to die, I wouldn't want to die hungry. I didn't want to die full. But he was full. He was full of years. He, he, had, he had lived a full life. And, uh, and oh, how sweet it is when someone lives a full life and then, and then um, gets to depart in peace. And I don't know about you. I would just as soon go that way. There's no guarantees. But uh, I would like to de- depart in peace if all possible. And so here in uh, chapter 25, we see... Uh, it starts off in verse 12 with the genealogy of Ishmael. Now, um, the Bible talks about us to uh, be um, careful with, with uh, genealogies, and, and we know, you know some of our friends in this part of the country are way into that. And um, um, it's not as important, it's not as important where you came from as it is to where you're going. Right, it's not as important to where you came from to where you're going. So where are you going? <laughs> I hope you know where you're going, because um, we can. We don't have to live in a, a a frivolous hope, but it's a certain hope. And so, this this person Ishmael, his genealogy is in the Bible. Uh, some think just be, for history reasons. Historically, that hey, you can go back, and today our our Muslim neighbors claim Ishmael as their dude. He's their man, right? That's who who they're they're proud of being a a descendant of, and um, and so let's read there. I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher some names for you, but we know we know um, we know Ishmael. I can pronounce that one in Abraham. So in verse twelve. Now, this is the genealogy of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar, the Egyptian, Sarah's maidservant, bore to Abraham. And these are the names of the sons of Ishmael. By their names, according to the generations, the firstborn of Ishmael, Nebajoth, then Kedar, then Adbeel, and then Mibsam, Mibsam, and Me. Misham, Misha, Misha, and then Duma, and then Masa, and Hadar, and Tema, and Jetur, and Nafish, and Kedma. These were the sons of Ishmael, and these were their names by their towns and their settlements, 12 princes according to their nations. These are the years of the life of, of Ishmael, 137 years. And he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. And they dwelt from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt, as you go towards Assyria. And he died in the presence of all his brethren. So here in these six or seven verses is the life of Ishmael. Now, um, if we... Think about what we just read. There's these 12 princes, and isn't that what God promised? He says, I'm going to bless them. They're going to be uh, great. There's going to be a multitude of them. Um, and and this, this genealogy that we are reading right here in Genesis chapter 25 is really uh, the early genealogies of Islam, Right? And a lot of people don't understand Islam. Islam really wasn't even established um, till 600 AD, right? So we got them beat by a long ways, historically. And um, Ishmael is a very important person to them, as well as Abraham, right? And uh, though not every Muslim on earth can trace his physical genealogy, genealogical heritage back to Ishmael, all Muslims can trace their spiritual heritage back to Ishmael. Kind of like us with Abraham, right? You guys sing. Father Abraham, 
had many sons. Let me hear it. And many sons had five. Well, and I was marching way too soon, right? Right arm. Right? Who, who sang that song growing up? Look at y'all, right? Uh, and so they, but they go back to Ishmael. And so we, we know, right? We know that, that, that that's not right. We know that's not right. Galatians chapter 4, verse 30, cast out the handmaid and who? Her son, Ishmael. They weren't, he wasn't the promised son. And isn't that just like Satan? He's a counterfeiter, right? He is a counterfeiter. This whole Muslim thing, it's a counterfeit. They borrowed all of the Hebrew law, right? In their Sharia law. So much of the Hebrew law is in their Sharia law. And um, so keeping this in mind, you go back to Genesis chapter 16, right? And, and it reminds us that what the Lord said to Hagar, this is, this is where the whole Muslim thing comes in. And um, the Lord asked her, hey, where, what are you doing? And she says, I'm fleeing from my mistress, Sarah. I and the angel of the Lord said to her, um, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. You see, the word submit is, is very important, a very important concept in Islam. And you see that, right? right? I remember when, when we flew to East Africa, we flew into Dubai. And, and we had to spend the night in Dubai. So we went to Pizza Hut in Dubai. And I don't know if you've ever been to Dubai or if you've seen pictures of Dubai, but then they had the island with, that was in the shape of the palm tree. They made an island in the shape of a palm tree. And out on, the, out on all the leaves of the palm tree were these multi-million dollar homes there in Dubai. And so the contrast was incredible. The very poor and the very rich. There's, there's nothing in the middle. And the first impression that I got getting off the plane was I'm thinking, I've never seen this many men wear dresses. <laughs> right? Because they were all in the white robes, uh, all the Muslim men. And the women, many of the women, and I mean, we saw this walking through the airport. There was a woman. She was all black. The only skin that you saw was right here that her veil didn't cover, the little bit of skin around her eyes. That's the only skin you saw. And she was walking 10 paces behind her man, right? That's, that's how they have to submit to that, right? How would you like that, girls, right? Let me, say, let me say something to you girls here in America. You are free indeed, right? You are free indeed. You know, you're not free to be... Uh, Let it all hang out, so to speak, right? But in comparison, right, you're, you're free indeed. And so actually the word Muslim means to submit or the submitted ones. That's what it means. And um, and even... They believe that it came, the term actually came from Abraham. And um, that Abraham called you Muslim men, Muslim. That that's many where they think that Abraham was a Muslim. Hey, let me tell you something. Abraham wasn't a Muslim. He was a worshiper of false gods, yes, before he met the God of heaven. But he was not a Muslim. And so you have to submit under their hand, right? And isn't it that the whole idea in Islam is they want the whole world to submit to their law. And if you won't, then they enforce it with the sword. Wouldn't you call that spiritual rape? Right, that they would force you? This stuff's a lie, folks, <laughs> right? It's a lie. And um, uh, I was listening to Skip Heitzig talk about it, and, and um, he, was, he was talking about that years ago that there was, um, uh, before Muhammad came on the scene, there was this place, it's a, it was a shrine called the Kaaba, 
and that it was once a shrine of, uh, that housed 360 different idols representing the 360 uh, various gods that were worshipped by the various Arab, Arab tribes in the, in the, in the re region there that we just read about, that they all went, went east of Egypt. And that um, Allah was one of these gods of the multiplicity of gods, and Allah was the moon god. And Muhammad took a very special liking to Allah and claimed that he was the one true God and that he wasn't uh, he wanted to unify all the Arab tribes, and so he squelched all the other gods and killed all, all those who didn't submit, and Islam was established, which would totally point to what we see on what happened on October 7th, right? By the sword, they want to go in, and they want to annihilate Israel, and I, if you're Jewish, I don't even know if you can be converted. They hate him that bad. Um, And it's a lie. And the Quran talks about it. It talks about doing away with the infidel. The infidel is anyone that doesn't embrace Islam. This is the roots. And we see it in our world. And I believe that we're to oppose it. Uh, with all of our heart. Now, does that mean we go take up arms and kill those who, who try to kill us? Well, I don't know. You'll have to pray about that one yourself. Right? Uh, I'm ready to go, so it doesn't, doesn't really matter. I don't, I don't, but I, I do, we do need to speak about it, and we knew, do need to call it what it is. The Bible tells us that in the last days, false teachers will come, right? Muhammad was a false prophet. Can I just say that? He was a false prophet. Joseph Smith was a false prophet. Um, false. They're telling lies. And... And, and people are believing the lie. And so, Ishmael dies, and it says there, right, that Ishmael dies, and he was gathered to his people. So what does this mean? We looked at it last time, right? That they're, they're in, in uh, Luke chapter 16, the two compartments. There was the comfort side that we read where, the, where Lazarus, the poor beggar who had died, was comforted in this comfort side. There was this torment side where the rich man was. And Abraham told him, so you can't come here and we can't go there. You're stuck. It's appointed for man wants to die and then to judgment. What was Ishmael's judgment? I have no idea. Right? Because we seem actually seemingly at peace in some earlier verses when him and Isaac came together to bury their father. That's God's call. I don't know what condition he died in. You know, a lot of people say, well, they're in hell. Well, you don't totally know that. If you read through the Bible and you see how gracious and how good God is, even with somebody who is wicked, if they turn to him in a moment, he, oh, okay, you can come be with me. I don't know. So he was either gathered to the place of torment or he was gathered to the place of comfort. I have no idea where Ishmael is. That's God's call. See, we are not to condemn people to hell. You and I don't have that authority. We, we, ha we, can, we can inspect fruit. We can call sin, sin. But for that final, ultimate judgment of eternal condemnation, you and I, our hands are off. You can't make that call, nor can I. We know who can, and we should fear and tremble in his presence, lest he make the torment side call on you and me. I have an old cowboy friend. He talks like this, and he's got this crooked preaching finger like this. <laughs> and he used to warm up for Franklin Graham at the Crusades. He'd get up, Franklin have him get up, and his, his spurs would go jingle, jangle, and he'd get up and he'd say, how many of you are glad you're not dead or in prison? <laughs> right? And then he would go off into his, <coughs> excuse me, he would go off into his spiel, uh, sharing the gospel, how God had changed and transformed his life. He was an old, old horse thief uh, out of Mexico and had gotten several knife fights and killed a few guys. And 
he is quite a flower, flowery character. But I called him here the other day to see how he's doing. He's in his 80s. I'd called him about 10 years ago and said, Brent, how you doing? Oh, he lives in Fallon, Nevada, kind of out in the brush. I said, Brent, how you doing? He says, oh, I'm doing pretty good. I said, um, what you been up to? He said, well, Janet B., his wife, won't let me go to town. I said, really? Why? She's afraid I'll kill somebody. <laughs> but he was telling me he had struck up this relationship with this Jesuit um, Catholic, and he said, you know, he says, I kind of like the Catholics because they actually believe you can still get in trouble with God, <laughs> right? I believe that too, by the way. You can still get in trouble with God, right? Be ye holy for he is holy. He's called us to this life. And, um, but this Ishmael, he dies and we don't know where he went, but we don't do know um, that his hand was just like what was prophesied about him back in chapter 16. We know that his hand was against every man. And, and that the Bible says he was, he, he was a, well, he was a wild donkey. And actually, that is a term of, of endearment. It's not a, it's not a um, insult because they're a, they're a very uh, hardy, um, wise animal that dwells in the deserts over there uh, where they're from. And so um, we don't know where he is. We sure do know what he left, though. What kind of legacy do you want to leave? So then we transition from Ishmael to Isaac. In verse 19, it says, and this is the genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as his wife. We read about that, you know, first, first lighting of a cigarette. And the daughter of, okay, you remember, lit off her camel? The daughter of Bethuel, notice he's, he's classified here as the Syrian of Padaram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. Now, if you look at Haran, where they were from, it was up in the region of modern-day Syria. Now, Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, If all is well, why am I, I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And so here's a different family, and they are both inquiring of the Lord. Man, isn't that a breath of fresh air? Wouldn't it be cool if people inquired of the Lord? Especially, uh, wouldn't it be cool if men prayed. It says that he, he, um, he prayed for his wife. He pleaded with the Lord for his wife. Gentlemen, have you been pleading with the Lord for your wife? Not necessarily to have a baby, but maybe her attitude needs to change. Maybe she needs to be blessed. Are you praying blessing over your wife? Men ought to do that. And Luke chapter 18, verse 1, Jesus said this, men, men, that's a, that's a male, just saying, Men is a male, adult male, always ought to pray and not lose heart. You should have a prayer life that doesn't weaken. You should have a prayer life that your wife can't weaken, which the Bible would suggest that sometimes we allow that to happen. Over in Colossians chapter 3, in verse 19, it says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter towards them. I have learned something over the years. I remember when, when I was uh, first married. I remember my little brother telling me, Scotty, pray for your wife. Now, he didn't go into detail. That's all he said. Pray for your wife. He didn't tell me every day. Several times a day, pray for your wife. He didn't tell me that. But I quickly learned that I needed to do that. I needed to do that for a couple of reasons. Now it says, don't be bitter. Uh, some, uh, some translations, embittered or 
uh, hateful towards them. Sometimes guys get so frustrated with their wife, they're not lifting them up in prayer. They're, they're in their mind and their heart, they're becoming embittered towards their brides. Now, no doubt, Rebecca was wanting to have a baby. It's been 20 years they've been married. Talk about fertility problems. And, and she wanted to have a baby. And so, so Isaac, in his wisdom, took her before the Lord. In 1 Peter, it talks about it as well. In verse 7, husbands likewise dwell with them, them there means your wives, with them with understanding, given honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Gentlemen, if you're bitter at your wife, I'm, I guarantee you, your prayers are hindered. And they ought not to be hindered, especially when it comes to the one that you're going to live your whole life with. The two shall become one flesh. My wife and I, we, we have uh, experienced some things just, to, just since uh, Out West has, has begun that it, it, it has grown us a lot. And I cannot imagine my, wa- my life without my wife. She is truly my completer. I was, I was looking at this, and there was a, there was a little article um, that came up. It, 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 and this was the title, Four Prayers Every Husband Needs to Pray Over His Wife. Four Prayers Every Husband Needs to Pray Over His Wife. And, and you could do this uh, with her or without her. But pray for your wife, men. Uh, and so the opening, opening paragraph says this, you, you will never love your wife more than when you pray for her. Humbling yourself before an all-powerful God and asking him to do what only he can in her life, that's a level of intimacy beyond anything the world has to offer. Praying for her makes you realize how much of a treasure she is to you. I say amen to that, and that is true. The woman God gave you, you're pouring yourself into her complete physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. And the four areas was to pray for her love, for her joy, for her need for you, and to guard her from spiritual attack. That's exactly what Jesus does for us. Right? He prays for us, his bride. And if you're a follower of Jesus and you're not doing that, you need to repent. And get on your knees and thank your God for your, your precious wife. So, so Isaac pleads. Uh, pleads. I, the, only word, the only thing I can think is a cowboy term that we always hear is don't weaken. Don't weaken on that, man. Be men of prayer. Always be praying. Paul tells us to pray without ceasing. So then Rebecca, she inquires about her kids. You know, your first time parents. And this baby's coming. Holy cow, do they rock your world or what? Right? They change your life. And, and it's never the same. Uh, my bride and I were reminiscing, you know, because we're, we're in, a, in a season where we got, we got eight grandchildren. And, and um, you know, we're eight, from age 21 to, to five months. And... Uh, it's, it's, it's really precious. And, um, but she was just, uh, remembering, um, uh, how hard it was. Right. And, um, and here Rebecca's going, Lord, if all is well, then why this? There was a tumult, right? Her rib cage were getting abused. No doubt her bladder was probably bruised, you know, from these two boys, uh, scrapping, uh, away in her womb. It, it, Having kids is a struggle, isn't it? it it's a struggle. It really is. Uh, I, I looked up some quotes uh, about parenting that was, that was uh, you know, occasionally you like your funny bone tickled. But uh, uh, 
This, this was a quote about parenting. It says, ever had a job where you had no experience, no training, you weren't allowed to quit, and people's lives were at stake? That's parenting. <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> I kind of like this one. It's, it's very modern. Having a child is like getting a tattoo on your face. You better be committed. I like this one. You hear it because you hear all kinds of, you know, uh, from, from people who don't have children, they try to counsel parents. This one was, parenting was much easier when I was raising my non-existent child, hypothetically. Yeah. <laughs> I like this one. Raising kids is part joy and part guerrilla warfare. This one comes on the heels of it. A two-year-old is kind of like having a blender, but you don't have a lid for it. <laughs> this lady said, before I got married, I had six theories about raising children. Now I have six children and no theories. <laughs> Me and my wife have experienced this one. Few things are more satisfying than seeing your own children have teenagers of their own. <laughs> Payback, glory. <laughs> and this last one, please keep this one in mind. Parenting without a sense of humor is like being an accountant who sucks at math. Don't you? You just, it's just like, you know, if you, if you kids live to have any kind of a normal life, glory, hallelujah. So as Rebecca goes to the Lord and she inquires of the Lord, the Lord actually speaks to her about this. And, and in verse 23, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. And so, two nations. Today, if you look at a map, they're right there together. They actually border each other, right? You have Israel, which is Jacob, and then you have Edom, which is modern-day Jordan, uh, right there to the, to the east of Israel. And so these, these two nations, Israel is the larger one. And um, so the Lord gives her a little bit of insight here, and it starts uh, early for Rebekah and, and Isaac as the boys are born in verse 24. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there was twins in her womb, and the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over. So they called his name Esau, Harry. Afterward, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. And so here the boys are born, right? The wrestling matches still continue. I mean, Esau's born, and Ike goes, oh, no, you don't. Whop. Right? The, the one who catches the heel. Some, some say he's a, he's a conniver. He's a, he's a, right, he's sneaky. He, he looks for his opportunity. And um, now, what's interesting is what God had told Rebecca, uh, he said, the older shall serve the younger. But he didn't tell her what that would look like. Right? Sometimes we get these little glimpses from the Lord, and we make our, our whole scenario. We go clear to the end of the, of the life of the person or our own life and thinking, well, God told me this. No, God gives her a tiny little vignette of what is going to happen between these two boys. The older will serve the younger. One will be stronger than the other one. Now, David Guzik says something cool about this. He says, it is, 
It is good to desire that the Lord would speak to us. But we must realize we do not hear perfectly from God. Because why? Because we have all these hindrances, right? We have all these hindrances. We have distractions in this life. We have our own ideas. We have emotions. We have the flesh. We see things so often without our spiritual eyes on. We can become far too confident in our ability to hear from the Lord and forget that it is easy for us to stop listening when God wants us to when God wants to keep speaking, we may add to what the Lord is saying or, or hear it clearly, but misunderstand the timing of the application of what the Lord says to us. You have to be careful, right? Pray a lot. Be cautious. Now, there are times, listen, there are times when God kicks you through a door, right? Right? And then slams it shut behind you. There are times when God does that. But there are other times when he is gently leading you. And you think, man, we feel like we should go this way. We've been praying about it and stuff. And you go that way and you think, oh, wow, this isn't what I thought. This isn't going the way I expected it to go. We need to be very careful, especially when older, when somebody older in the Lord says, the Lord told me, the Lord told me. Now, if the Lord told you, that's awesome. Just don't put that on somebody else. I've had people over the years, hey, pastor, uh, the Lord told me to tell you. Well, I tell them, well, you pray then that the Lord tells me that, right? Right? Because if God can speak to you, I feel like he can speak to me just as easily, right? So, so you just have to be careful with those things. You can confuse people, people who are young in the Lord, um, get all watered up about some of these things. Because Paul tells us, listen, right now, you and I, we see through a glass darkly. We see through a glass darkly. The fact that God can get anything done with us is an absolute miracle, Right? But we see through a, through a glass darkly. I love what the, the apostles did in the, in the book of Acts in, in chapter 15 where it says, For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. We have to realize we miss God all the time. But what is really cool is God allows you turns. <laughs> so if you miss God on something, right, just take a step back. Say, oh, missed you there, Lord. God's okay with that. Right? Because he's into second and third and fourth and hundredth chances. God's so good that way. So I'm thinking that Rebecca took the little bit that the Lord told her and might have um, went after some stuff that, that she shouldn't have. And, but it's all too easy. Verse 27, and the boys grew... And Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Here we have it, right? Favoritism. Parental favoritism. Now, I, I mean, I raised four kids. I know that some kids you just naturally get along with a little bit easier than you do the other ones, right? Right? The other ones stir up murder in your heart frequently. But that's just something that you need to learn to ride herd on, right? As you, as you grow with your kids. And, um, and, and, but, but these two, notice, it says, people say that Jacob was a mama boy. The word mild there, for he was a mild man, means complete. So maybe Jake was just, hey, I'm just cool hanging here. Learn how to cook. Uh, and Esau was a man, right? He's a hunter, like to kill things, like to kill things. And, and you know, and, he, and, and Isaac liked that too, because uh, food was great. Loved the venison, didn't have to slaughter any of his own. And um, 
He was good with that. But we know Rebekah loved Jacob and Isaac loved Esau. And verse 29 says, now Jacob cooked a stew and Esau came in from the field and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with the red stew for I am weary. Therefore, his name is called Edom. Edom means red. The, the children of Edom were the descendants of Esau. And there's a difference between these two boys. One liked to go out into the field and hunt. Now, I like to do that. Does that mean I'm bad? Who's, who's, who's blessed here, Jacob or Esau? Well, Esau was a good hunter. So a lot of guys in this room would say, oh, he's, he's a good shot. He's a cool dude. He's right on with God because he can shoot straight. But, you know, a lot of guys would rather go hunting than come to a meeting like this. Many guys. Guys, if that's you, you better check yourself. Right? Just check yourself. I know I have, over the years, I've taken a a church day off to go hunt. And, uh, but, you know, what's really funny is a lot of times opening day, people get skunked. Right? Right? So why, if if opening day is on a Sunday, go to church and then see what the Lord will provide on those next days. Second, third day, sometimes it was was a great, uh, great hunt. It's really putting your priorities in order and checking your own heart. I mean, getting out and and going and doing this stuff is, it's, it's awesome, Right? The Lord does speak to you through his creation. But to put it above, to put it above uh, your spiritual life is is not a good thing, Uh, but to use it. And so um, he's, Esau's coming in from hunting, he's hungry, Esau's made, or Jacob's made some food in, in verse 31, but Jacob said, sell me your birthright. As of this day, he's hungry. He's a man of appetite. He can't wait. Maybe he would be one of those in the New Testament, they call him a glutton, right? The Bible condemns gluttony. And um, today, sell me your birthright. He knew Esau. He knew his character, right? That he would go for it. And Esau said, look, I am about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Really? Really? You're not about to die. You're hungry. You know, when you get hangry, and uh, Esau here is hangry, and he's like, birthright, smirthright. What is this birthright to me? Well, actually, it's a lot, a whole lot. And he's despising it. It says here, So the birthright really seems to be up for grabs. He's seriously thinking of selling his birthright for a bowl of beans. Then Jacob, verse 33, said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. And then he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus, Esau despised his birthright. Well, what is this birthright? Well, it's, 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 it's pretty, pretty powerful, actually. The firstborn had lots of benefits. If you were the firstborn son, you had a lot of benefits, right? Um, we see Isaac, though he wasn't the firstborn, he was the firstborn as far as God was concerned because he was the firstborn son of promise, Isaac was, right? And who, what Isaac get? He got everything. Though Abraham gave gifts to the other boys, Isaac got everything. And so along with being the firstborn, there's a lot of responsibility. You had to take care of your parents. That was the, that was the firstborn son's responsibility. Uh, you had to be a spiritual leader for your family. Uh, you had to be a financial leader for your family. Uh, when, when the parents died, the firstborn got two-thirds of all the goods, the rest, all the rest of the siblings, didn't matter if there was one or 20, they split the other one third. The firstborn got two thirds. 
When I was in Africa, I was going out ministering to the widows, to the widows with a guy by the name of Julius. Julius was a young pastor there uh, and uh, had an incredible story, but he was from a Muslim family, his, and his father was a polygamist. But Julius, Julius was the oldest born son of this polygamist. And this man and one of his wives wanted to sell some ground. And they had to get permission from Julius to do it. That's how much authority the firstborn son had. And, and Esau despises it, despises this, this birthright that, uh, that God had given to the firstborn. Maybe that's why it says in the New Testament, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Maybe it's because Esau hated God first. You say, that's so unfair for God to predetermine to somebody to judgment. Though God has the right to do that? I don't know that God does that all the time. I think God gives everybody an opportunity because he's willing that none should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth to be saved. So Esau thought little of his spiritual heritage connected to the birthright. He valued only the material things, right? A bowl of beans. And so a spiritual birthright meant little to him when his uh, stomach was hungry, right? He was a man with priorities, right? I need a bowl of beans. Many, if not most people, also pri uh, place little value on spiritual things. When I find somebody that is just really tuned in, especially a man, right? M men that are really tuned into the Lord and truly honestly walking with God and submitted to him and have a desire for, for righteousness and truth. I like that man. I, I want to know more about that man. Donald Gray Barnhouse, the old preacher, said this, history shows that men prefer illusions to realities. Boy, ain't that the truth today and what we see, especially with technology and the addiction to pornography and all those things. Men prefer illusions to realities, choose time rather than eternity. They want what they want. They want it now. And pl the pleasures of sin for a season rather than the joys of God forever. I don't know about you, have you noticed that the things in this life truly do grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace and the promises that God has for those who love him? That eye has not seen nor his ear heard? He goes on, he says, men will read trash rather than the word of God and adhere to a system of priorities that leaves God out of their lives. Multitudes of men spend more time shaving than on their souls. The multitudes of women give more minutes to their makeup than to the life of the eternal spirit. Men still sell their birthright for a mess of pottage. That's what Donald Gray Barnhouse says. The Lord has a lot of stuff for us, you guys. Because in that place of birthright, right, we, you and I, have the place of the firstborn in Christ Jesus. You and I have that. Because we are joint heirs with him. And you, you read throughout the New Testament, it tells us that he, the heir, Christ Jesus, the son, gets everything. He inherits it all, all those good and perfect gifts, the ability to create all these things that God's given to the Son, we get. You can read about it in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses 3 through 14. It shows us a, a treasuries of, of the riches that are ours by the birthright in Jesus Christ. He's a firstborn from the dead. You're going to rise from the dead if you've embraced him as your Lord and Savior. 
Every spiritual blessing it talks about there in Ephesians, the blessing of being chosen in Jesus, adoption into God's family, complete acceptance by God in Christ, redemption from our slavery to sin, true and total forgiveness, the riches of God's grace, the revelation and knowledge of the mystery of God's will, and eternal inheritance, the guarantee of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Boy, good thing we have that, right? Could you make it right now without the Holy Spirit? You can't do it. You can't, you can't live this life without it. Far too many people neglect or trade away their birthright for cheap entertainment or monetary popularity or passing pleasures. This time of year, we always watch the National Finals Rodeo. And, uh, and a few of those people you, you watch and kind of follow their careers and stuff and I couldn't help but think of a young man that's been on top of the world the last few years, and, and now it's just like he has an injury, and it's like his world has come to an end. But where do you place your priorities? Is it your business? Is it your home? Is it your family? Or is it that preeminence? We talked about last week, we're giving Jesus that first place and realizing that all those things will come. Whatever you need in this life, folks, God will give you. But keep your priorities right. Don't get sidetracked. Don't let your hunger for certain things lead you astray. Because in the end, none of it satisfies. None of it. Also this week, they've been resurrecting the old champions. <laughs> These guys are old. Some of them can't even hardly walk, right? But they're still living 40 years ago. It's like, no, you got stuff in front of you. Don't just hang on to your, you know, your gold buckle laurels that are 50 years old that are getting faded and gone. Walk with your God. Don't be accused of like Esau, which I'm going to close with here. And if you have a Bible, turn there with me, would you? It's uh, Hebrews chapter 12. And, and, and I'm starting in verse 12, and I'm just going to read this, and, and we'll close this morning. But it's just that contrast where the writer of Hebrews tells us and encourages us in verse 12 of chapter 12, therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Peace with all people and holiness without if you don't have those, no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for a morsel of food sold his birthright, and for you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. What about you? That should strike fear in your heart. It's like he crossed a line, and even though he wanted to go back and make it right, he wanted his birthright back. He wanted the blessing that Jacob actually stole from him. And his dad said, sorry, son, that's gone. You had your chance. You really did. You and I, we've all had our chance. How's it going? Are you all right? I said, God allows you turns. Maybe you need to make one of those. I don't know. That's between you and him. But if he's calling you on, you on you to do it, please do it. Saying, oh, Lord, can we start over? I pray that he'd grant it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. 
your incredible grace and mercy towards us. Lord, we say we love you, but many times it's questionable because of the way we live and what we do. So I ask that you, Lord, would uh, Lord, just bring us to that place of being hungry, just as Esau was hungry for that bowl of soup. Lord, that we would be hungry for the things of you, for your spirit, for your word, for a communion with you and with, with our brothers and sisters, Lord, that it would be sweet, that we would draw near to you in these last days as we find ourselves in a, in a tumultuous time in this world. And yet we got a God who holds, a, holds us in his hand. So Lord, do a work in your people. For those who need to make a U-turn, I just pray right now as we're in an attitude of prayer, just in your heart, just cry out to the Lord. Just as Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his Rebecca, maybe you need to plead with the Lord for someone in your life or maybe your own life. And he has a ready ear for anyone who humbles himself. Lord, we do humble ourselves before you today and just thank you that you, you do have that ready ear to hear. And you've come to set the captives free. And I just lift up anyone in this room today that is captive to anything. They know it. And they, they want away from it. Lord, would you deliver them? In, in the power of your Holy Spirit, you're able to do these things as we ask. Lord, we lift up all of those who are hurting, Lord, and just thinking of so many today that are just need that touch from you, Lord, physically, and uh, Lord, uh, emotionally, and, and spiritually as well. Lift up Dick Hunter to you. Pray for um, Jen Murray, Lord, just uh, that you would bless these people. For Jane Cuppy, we lift her up to you, Lord. Father, thank you that we can come before you and bring these needs before you. So, Lord, we yield our hearts to you. Do a work. Do a work in our heart as we humble ourselves before you and we ask in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Let's all stand. If you need prayer, prayer team will be over here to my right, your left, and uh, be blessed today.